Well, good morning. Like Steve said, my name is Steven, and I am the youth director here uh, at Calvary, and, uh, which means that I deal with teenagers from 7th through 12th grade. And the teenagers of our culture today, they are uh, commonly known as Gen Z. And you probably heard of things like millennials or baby boomers or Gen X. So Gen Z is essentially the newest generation uh, that we have. And it's described that usually anyone who's born between the year, give or take a year or two, of 1996 to about the mid 2000s, uh, which means that the majority of them are, are teenagers at this point. And what I can say is, is that teenagers in our culture and young people in our culture, uh, sometimes they get a bad rap. Uh, sometimes you'll have people who, um, who, who will look at them and, and not think highly of them because they're too glued to their technology or they're just a little bit different than everyone else. But I wanna say, before I go any further, I want you guys to know that I truly, truly believe that I've never met a more intelligent, compassionate, and hardworking generation in, in my life. And I truly believe that is, that is who our, our teenagers are. And will you believe me when I tell you uh, that God is going to fulfill his kingdom through our teenagers here in our world today. I desperately, desperately believe that. So I believe there is hope and good news for our future in our, in our teenagers. Can I get an amen for that, please? Thank you. But let's be honest. Teenagers are a little weird. They're a little weird. I'll be honest with you. Teenagers, you're in the room. Just acknowledge it. You're a little weird sometimes. And, and here's why. Parents of teenagers, or if you're a teacher, or if you've dealt with teenagers a lot at all, you know that sometimes teenagers can be a little difficult to work with and hard to communicate with. We'll, we'll say that. Hard to communicate with. You don't always know what they're feeling or what they're thinking. They're not always going to share with you their thoughts and, and things like that. And that, that's pretty common. And what I can say is that that's not unique to our teenagers today. When I was a teenager, that's how I was. When you were a teenager, that's probably how you were too. That's not really unique. However, I will say that what is unique to Gen Z, the teenagers of our culture, is that, I don't know if you know this, but they have almost 100% completely constructed a brand new language. I don't know if you guys know this or not. I got a yes over there. And I'm gonna give you an example. I'm not, I'm not just gonna blow smoke here. I'm gonna give you an example of what this would look like. So bear with me here. This, imagine for a moment that you're, you're 15, 16 years old and you're coming out to second on a Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. right here in this room. This is a conversation that you might hear. I promise you, this is a real life conversation. It's gonna be up on your screen here. So what I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna have you read what this conversation could be like and then, and then afterwards, I'm going to reveal it. You guys ready? So friend one could say, my guy, yesterday I had a meal that low-key slaps. It was mad sus, no cap. <laughs> to which their friend would reply, yo, say less. I'm mad salty right now. That sounds lit. <laughs> I promise you, everybody in that room would know what they're saying. So for all of you who are 17 and above, I'm going to take the moment and, and explain what this means. I'm going to translate this for you guys here, okay? I'm going to translate it. So again... Keep your eyes on the screen here. This is what this sentence, give or take, means a little bit here. <laughs> hey friend, yesterday I had a meal that was quite honestly the greatest delicacy I could ever enjoy. It was very suspicious how someone could make food quite that enjoyable. I'm being 100% honest with you. To which their friend would reply, no way, I've heard all I need to hear. I am extremely jealous that I did not get to enjoy this meal with you, but it sounds absolutely wonderful. Kid you not, this is a real life language. It happens every day. People know about it. It's happening here. So this is, this is one of the, the bigger issues, not an issue, but this is one of the common things that's happening with, with teenagers in our culture. And it can, if we're honest, sometimes it can be difficult to, to communicate with any young people of all generations. And it can be difficult to communicate. And, and how many of you guys know that, that sometimes when, when you're unable to communicate with someone or you feel like there's a lack of communication, there's walls that get built up. It's why sometimes Sometimes why we're hesitant to build relationships with people who are younger than us because we, we don't really get what they're saying. We don't really understand what's going on. But that's true for almost every area of our life too. If we meet or run into people of, of different cultures or races or, or ethnic groups or, or demographics, if they're communicating in a different way, a different style, or even a different language, there's almost these walls that get built up because we can't understand them. So they seem almost less approachable. Do you guys know what I'm, what I'm saying here? 
So this is true in almost, in almost all areas of our life. And, and more importantly, when there's lack of communication, that feels like there's walls or barriers where we can't, we can't interact with them. And I believe that this is even more specifically true with our relationship with God. That if we feel like there's a moment where there's lack of communication between us and God, we feel like walls have gone up and it feels like God is no longer there or listening or communicating back to us. And I have found that this is, and you probably experienced this too, I found that this is more uh, specifically true in seasons where we're going through deep, dark pain, hurt, and anguish. When there's moments where we, where we feel like we're in, in incredible pain, sometimes it feels like there's a lack of communication between us and God, and it feels like he's no longer there. So the question we, we ask ourselves, I know I'm not the only one who's asked myself this question before. Where is God in the midst of suffering? Where is God in the midst of suffering? Because here's, here's the problem. I don't have to look far to see how sickness has destroyed our world, how sin has destroyed our world, or how loved ones who we love dearly are, are, are broken and, and how much that hurts and how much that destroys us. I don't have to look far to see those types of examples. This is a real thing that we all struggle with. And at one point in time or another, we ask ourselves the questions, where is God in the midst of suffering? And I want to look at a passage um, of a guy, his name is King David. He's found in the Old Testament. And he asked the same exact question. And I think we can find some really good insight from what he has to say about this very same question. But before we read this passage, you need to understand something about David. David went through some incredibly painful things in his life. Some incredibly painful things, including he had his best friend killed. His newborn son at one point died. He had his friend and his mentor, the one that he looked up to for years, attempted to kill him because he was jealous of him. He even committed sins that left him so mortally wounded and other people so mortally wounded. He lived the rest of his life with guilt and shame of what he has done. David had experienced some, some devastating heartache in, in his life. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to picture these things as we read this passage. We don't know exactly what, what led David to write uh, this verse here, but I want you to imagine that if you were in those situations, some of you guys have experienced those things. But if you were there, I want you to get that context for the cries that are in David's voice when we read this. Does that work? So this is found in Psalm chapter 22, starting in verse one. This is the words of King David. He says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. And you, our ancestors, put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and they were saved. And you they trusted and they were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. So David starts to experience some of the most heartbreaking, devastating things that, that people can ever walk through. And the worst part about all of this, it's not only that he's just experiencing these things, it's not that he's just experiencing this pain, but now it feels like God is not there anymore. That God is, is no longer listening to him. He's no longer hearing his cries that God has forgotten about him. And I, I honestly believe that we could walk through seasons a little bit easier if we just knew what God was doing, right? If God could just tell us, hey, I know this hurts right now. I know this is difficult, but here's what I'm doing. I'm setting this up, this up, and this up, or I'm working on this in you. If God would just communicate that to us, it would be a little bit easier. But the trouble is, is that often when we're in these moments, it feels like he's not communicating at all and that he's distant. 
So David cries out and he's in this moment. He says, my God, my God, I can just hear the, the anguish in his voice. He says, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? And he goes on to scream out to God. And, and, and then later in verse four, he even points to uh, the situations and he, he recognizes, he says, he says, I've seen you, God, perform miracles. I've heard the stories of how you've come through. I've heard what you've done for my fathers and the generations before me. But for whatever reason, it seems like you're unable to now or you're unable unwilling to. And on top of that, verse seven, he starts talking about how people are now mocking him. They're mocking him for still trusting in God, for still putting their faith in him. And they're saying, what are you doing, David? Stop. God's not listening. You can keep reaching out to him, but he's not listening. Leave that. It becomes mocked and ridiculed and it accumulates to this point where, where David cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? And here's the trouble with this question is that this is a deeply personal question. David is not in this moment. He, he, he is not in this moment raising an intellectual debate as to the presence of good and evil in the world and how a good God can, can allow evil in the world. This is not some intellectual debate that David is writing. This is a deep personal question out of the experiences and pain of his own heart. If a natural disaster hits on the other side of the world, our heart bleeds for those people, right? They bleed and, and sometimes we give money or resources or we go help and serve, but it, it, it tears us apart to see those things. But it's a whole different story when it's our own brother or sister who passes. It's a whole different story when it's us who's walking through life with deep depression or anxiety that, that is crippling us that we can't walk through. It, it's a whole different story when it's our loved ones who are sick lying in a hospital bed. David is raising a deep personal question and it's one that we raise often of my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the trouble with this, this passage, the hard part of Psalm 22 is that if you read this entire chapter, there's no resolution. There's no moment where God comes through and like superhero lands or like Captain America or anything like that and starts to begin to fix everything that David's walking through. There's no moment where God begins to restore the things that David lost. There's no moment where the outward appearances of everything that David's walking through begins to get resolved. It, it kind of just ends. Except for one major shift, not in David's external aspect but there's a shift inside of him, inside of his heart. So throughout all of this, David is crying out these, these prayers. He's angry, he's frustrated, he's sad, he's confused. But there's this moment in, in verse 22 where, where David begins to praise and worship God. He begins to praise and worship God. Not only that, he's encouraging the people around him to do the same. And he encourages them to praise and worship God. He starts calling out or God's characteristics. And this is, this is what it says in verse 22. It says, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. So David gets to this moment where he begins to praise and worship God. Despite everything that's going else around him, his, his external experience remains the same. But despite all of those things, David begins to worship God, to praise his name, to shout the goodness of God from the rooftops. He begins to praise and worship in, and in prayer. And there's something inside David that shifts. In verse 24, it says that David begins to recognize that God is near. I want to read verse 24, the end of that again. It says that he has not hidden his face from him, but he's listened to his cry of help. It is through this that David begins to see and experience not only that God is still with him, but he begins to see that the entire time God was there working everything together. And here's our default. Our default is when we experience these things 
when there's loved ones who are sick, when, when we are sick, is to retreat from God. Our default is to stop praying, to stop worshiping, to stop reading scripture, to stop going to church because we try to retreat from God. But David decides that he's going to double down on his trust in God. He's going to invest in this relationship. We saw in verse seven how, how people were, were mocking him because how much he still trusted God. And he begins to still trust and say, I'm going to praise, I'm going to worship him no matter what. Nothing about his situation changes, but yet there's something internally that changes inside of him where now he can now see and experience where God is. God does not change. God did not move. God was there the whole time, but there's something that changes in his spirit where now he can recognize, I feel you, God. I know that you are here. I know that you are working and I've seen what you are doing. So what, where do we go from there, right? Here's what I think we should do. I think we should double down on our trust in God. If you're in that moment, maybe you're, you're walking in, in incredible, I'm telling you guys, depression and anxiety throughout this year has absolutely ravished our, our culture. Double down on your trust in God. And that may not sound helpful. Like I've had people tell me in my life, you just gotta trust God, man, bro. You just gotta trust God. Like, okay, thanks, buddy. Like, that's not helping me. What, how, what does that even mean? <laughs> how do I trust God more? And David decides that the way that he is going to do this is through prayer and worship. He was going to invest in that relationship with God. He was not going to retreat. He was going to move forward. And he, and he vents his frustration and anger at God. He, he's raw with it. He, he's not holding anything back. He, he vents that out and begins to worship him and trust him that his name is good. Even if he doesn't feel like it yet, he's going to trust that his name is good. And then there's this shift inside of his heart, and inside of his life, where he begins to sense the presence and the working of God. What would it look like for me and for you if we were to double down on that trust in God and say, I'm not going to retreat. I'm not going to fall away. I'm not going to harden my heart, but I'm going to invest. Though it hurts, though it's painful, I'm going to invest in this relationship with God. What would it look like for me and for you to sing songs of praise to him? To worship, to stay connected in scripture, to stay connected to a community of believers through church so we can be encouraged and uplifted. What would it look like if we doubled down on that? How would that change our perspective? Because again, God doesn't change in that. God's the same, but something changes in us where we remove this hardness of our heart and we begin to see what God is up to. We may not have answers. We don't know exactly what God is doing, but we get to sense that his arms are around us. He's there, he's present, and he is working. Does that make sense? What would it look like to double down on our trust in God? David started to sense God's presence through prayer and worship. I believe that is the key that allows us to step in and enter into God's presence. And I need you guys to know this and get this too, because I think this is really important. I believe that God is still there. I believe that he's still working, that he still loves you. He still has a plan and purpose. He's not abandoned our world. He has not abandoned you as an individual. He still moves forward. Sometimes we just can't see that yet, but it doesn't mean he's not there. He's still working. He's there for you. But good news, I haven't even got to the best part yet. I'm hyped about this. Haven't even got to the best part yet. There's this prayer that David prays. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was not the only time that this prayer has been prayed. In fact, it was prayed by somebody else over a thousand years after David's life. It was prayed by Jesus. 
This is found in Matthew 27. And in Matthew 27, Jesus comes down and he, he lives his life on earth as God fulfills his mission and, and starts building his kingdom here on earth. And there's this moment where now he's on the cross and he's experiencing the wrath of God. He's experiencing the sin of our world. And he's taking that all on himself. And he says this, this is found in Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 45. This is Jesus hanging on the cross in the most difficult moment of his life. It says, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the most pivotal moment of human history, Jesus quotes the words of David. And we gotta be clear on this. J Jesus is not quoting out the first Bible verse that comes to his mind uh, and, and just preaching that out from the cross. This is not something that he just randomly thought of. He's like, oh, that's a good prayer to pray. Let me pray this. He is quite literally quoting the prayer and the words of David. Remember, this is a personal question. And in this moment, Jesus is giving a very personal response. He's telling David, and he's telling us, he said, David, I hear you. I heard your cries. I heard your anger. I heard your, your pain. I heard, heard the anguish inside of your voice. I heard all of those things. And guys, if we can know that Jesus heard David, we could be confident that he hears us too. But here's the best part. I still haven't got to the best part about this. The best part about all this is that when Jesus cried out this prayer on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because he really was forsaken by God in that moment. He experienced the full wrath that we deserved on the cross. He experienced all of the sin that, that we carried. He experienced that he was forsaken by God. Why? So that we never have to live a moment in this life or the next without God. There never has to be a day where we are separated from God through, through the highest of mountains or the lowest of valleys. We can know that God is with us because of what Jesus did on that cross and what he did through his resurrection. We can know that God is near. It is a deeply personal question that requires an incredibly personal response. And Jesus takes it upon himself. He says, I heard David's cry and I heard your cry. He knows your cry. And he's there. So what would it look like for me and for you if we doubled down on that? If we trusted in that, when we're walking through moments of, of deep anxiety, when we're, we're filled with fear, and we're, we're, we're struggling to know if God even cares or if he's listening at all. Looking at what Jesus has accomplished through the cross and through his resurrection, that is proof every single day that God cares about you. He is there for you. He is not going to abandon you. If your faith and trust is in him, he will never leave you. It's a deeply personal question that requires a deeply personal response. What would it look like if we doubled down on that? to trust in his work, his power, even if we can't feel it yet. And again, I think that looks like, I honestly, I think practically that looks like us engaging in worship, engaging with, with, with prayer and reading scripture and, and being a part of, our, our, of a church community. Because all of those things invest in that relationship with God that allow us to not, not, fix everything, but to know that God is there, he's working and he's with us. David trusted in that. He trusted in that and he recognized, though I'm walking through this valley, I know that God is there with me. What would it look like to double down on that? So I'm gonna, I wanna invite the worship team to come back up before we close here. But I also, I wanna share a story here as well. Um, 
A few years back, quite a few years back, actually, it was a while ago at this point, um, I had a, a, a teenager who, who wanted to get together with me. And this, this kid, he, he's been through a lot, like just went through uh, the ringer in life. And, um, and quite honestly, as, as he was sharing his story and sharing the things that he was, he was going through, it was things that I, I've never experienced before. It was things that I have no idea what it feels like to walk through these things. So and he's sharing with me and he, he's angry, he's upset, he's sad, he's confused. And more importantly, he feels he doesn't know where God is or what God's doing. And so he meets with me and we get together and I'm like, okay, great. And I just start like going in. I, I, I start pulling out passages of scripture and I'm like, hey, look at this, look at this. I start or bringing up different messages that I, and I thought were really helpful. And I, I start sharing a message idea that I was thinking about giving. And I start bringing out all of these different theological truths and things like that. And I look at him and he's got tears in his eyes. I'm like, He's getting it. Like what I'm doing is working. Like he, he's getting it. So I keep going and I, I'm, I'm really drilling down on this. I'm going and I look at him again. I look in his eyes and his eyes are filled with tears. And in that moment, it's like the Holy Spirit slapped me. He says, you idiot. This kid has not listened to a single thing you've said in the last 10 minutes. Not a single word had registered to him about anything that I said in that moment. So I remember, I, again, I feel like God just, just slapped me across the face. He said, he said, let him know how much I love him. So I stopped talking, I closed my mouth, I looked at him in his eyes, and in that moment, I could just, I could see the hurt. I could see the pain inside of his eyes. I could see the confusion. I could feel the, the abandonment that he had in his heart as he sat there with, with tears in his eyes, not knowing where to do or what, what God was up to at all. And I remember just looking at him, I said, do you, do you know that God loves you still? He just broke down at that point. I, I think that, that understanding theological ideas is incredibly important. I build my entire life on that, and I think you should too. I think understanding passages of Scripture is incredibly important. I think we should live our lives going after that. But sometimes you just need to know that God loves you. And I need to tell you this right now too. Do you know that God still loves you? Do you still know that God is still working, that he has not abandoned you? I need you to know that. He is still there, he is still working, and he still loves you. He has not forgotten you. Jesus proved that. He has not forgotten you. What would it look like to double down on that? even if we don't feel it yet, even if we don't want to experience it, if we double down on that trust that he is still there, that I can put my faith and trust in him. He's still there, he's still working. God is with you. Can I get an amen on that? Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for you. Lord God, I recognize that there are people in this room right now, there are people who are watching online right now uh, who, who are scared to let you know what they're really thinking. Who are, there are people who have loved ones in the hospital right now. There are, there are people who have children who are walking away from God. There, there, are, there are people in this room who are dealing with deep anxiety and depression that is crippling their lives. Lord, I pray now that you would wrap your arms around them, that they would experience your love, that they would know that you are there and you have not forgotten about them, that your plans and your word is good and you fulfill all of your promises. Lord, I pray for those who are watching online right now. Maybe, maybe there are some who are too afraid to even show up into a, a building because, because they were afraid that you would not approve of them. Uh, or maybe there are some who are afraid to turn on a screen today because they felt like they were not worthy to be in your presence. God, would you let them know that because of Jesus, they can have access to you. Would you show them your love, Lord God? Would you be with them? We pray these things in your name. Amen.